Howard. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Um, okay, I wrote a little something here, and if I can get my glasses on and read it. Oh, and I've also got it, wait a minute, it's in the Kindle. So let's see if I can read it on the Kindle. But it's this little thing I wrote for you because it is a mashup of material from the God problem. And we authors will write a paragraph 20 times or 50 times to finally get it rich enough to give to you. We want to make it as rich as a pastry, period. And when we speak, we're one person. But when we're writing, we're 50 people. We're a chorus of 50 people trying to concentrate all of their brains into something to get across an idea. So rather than speaking ex tempore, um, which we'll do later, I've written this little thing for you, and it's just a teaser. Um, let's see if it tells me how to get to the beginning of this document. Go to and beginning. OK, beginning. And it isn't a summary of the book. Um, because a book is there to jolt the way you think, to get you thinking in radically different ways than you've ever thought before, to get you looking at the things that you take for granted every single day as if you've never seen them before, realize how alien they are, and realize how easily they could be replaced by something radically different. Um, so this book only gives you a little hint. And it starts, because the book is the God problem, it starts with a God joke. And we'll do this one extemporary. There are these Two little boys, eight and ten. They're the worst little boys you've ever seen in your life. They are the children of the omen. They wait until midnight when their parents have fallen asleep. They steal all the money from their parents' wallets, just leaving enough so the parents don't notice. They lie fire to every single structure they can find that looks the least bit flammable. And they torture pussycats and any other small animals they can get their hands on. Their parents are at wits. And, you know, they're good, liberal parents. They're supposed to give their kids their creative freedom. And this is not working out. Um, it looks like it's going to be the destruction of humanity if these kids ever get their hands on nuclear weapons. So they read about a nun who has a remarkable gift with difficult children. She not only has her PhD in special education, but she's a traditional disciplinarian, tough love. So they contact the nun, and the nun is kind enough to come over to their house in exchange for a small donation for the church, and sits down. She wants to sit down with the kids one at a time. So she sits down with kid number one, the 10-year-old. And she's got her steel ruler in her hand, and she says ever so gently, just as a conversational opener, the simplest question she can think of, son, where is God? And the little boy sits there and doesn't say a word. So she gets a little less patient, and she says a little more sternly, son, where is God? And the little kid still doesn't answer. So she taps her palm with the steel ruler and comes out with that kind of controlled fury that has taken command of kids from the South Bronx to Compton, California. And she says, son, I'm asking you, where is God? And the kid runs away and hides in a closet. Now, his little brother knows that this is the closet where they usually plan strange things, like the next garage to burn, um, and comes into the closet to see what's going on. And the older kid is trembling. And he says, we're, we're in really big trouble this time. God is missing. <laughs> and, and they think we did it. <laughs> All right, that's the obligatory joke to open, you know, anything that you ever attempt to do in life. And it does have to do with a missing God. So we'll skip over that because we told you this. Now, look. Okay, now we're going to get serious. Picture this. You and I are seated at a cafe table in the nothingness before the Big Bang. You are a wildly imaginative visionary, and I'm a hard-nosed, got to see it to believe it conservative. You have extraordinary visions, and I am a stick in the mud, a crust of toast, committed to logic and to common sense. 
you and I have nothing better to do, so we've been sitting here at our outdoor table, sipping one espresso after another and piling up empty coffee cups by the thousands ever since the nothingness began. You should see the size of our tab. <laughs> but here's the point. Absolutely nothing is happening, right? Why? Because there is nothing. No thing. No action, no space, no time, no form, no substance, no shadow, no sunshine, no sticks, no stones, no bones, not a single solitary thing. And there never has been. Suddenly, you perk up. You have a nutty vision, an insane daydream. You point to a spot in the blackness a few feet away from our table, and you tell me that if I watch very carefully, I will see a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick smash from the nothingness, then expand at super speed, blowing up like a hyperkinetic balloon, sneezing forth like an expanding handkerchief, a speed rush sheet on steroids, a manifold of raw space and time. Look, the boredom must have gotten to you, I tell you. What you're claiming is loony and it defies the laws of logic. I've been sitting here across the table from you forever. I've kept my eyes peeled, and there never has been a pinprick of any kind. What's more, this wacky stuff you call space and time has never existed either, nor will it ever exist. Why? Because nothing comes from nothing. Zero plus zero equals zero. The idea that this basic fact could ever change is ridiculous and it defies the first law of thermodynamics, the law of the conservation of matter and energy, a law so basic that every respectable 21st century scientist will someday declare it thoroughly and completely right. While I, in exasperation, am trying to get simple logic across to you, wham, a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick suddenly shows its head. It's what physicists like Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose will someday call a singularity. I'm stunned. This simply does not make sense. But you stay cool and act as if nothing is happening. Meanwhile, that pinprick blows up so fast that it makes me dizzy, and sure enough, it has three properties that have never existed before. Three properties that, if common sense prevailed, should not exist. Those properties are time, space, and speed. Time, space, and energy. How in the non-existent world did the nothingness pull this off? The pinprick keeps whooshing outward like the rubber sheet of a trampoline on a growth binge, unfurling as a super-speed space-time manifold, an Einsteinian space-time manifold. I'm stunned. What the heck is space? What in the world is time? And what is powering all the speed? Who in the world invented these peculiar things? And if they weren't invented, how the hell did the utter emptiness burp them out? While I'm sitting here with my jaw dropping, you are as cool as a scoop of gelato in a block of ice. Finally, you open your mouth again, and you make another of your wacky predictions. That unfurling sheet, that giant sail of space and time, you say, is about to produce something called things. And those things are going to precipitate from the sheet of space and time and speed the way that raindrops precipitate from a storm cloud. Look, now I know you've lost it. You got me with your prediction about the pinprick. But that was beginner's luck, and dumb luck of that kind doesn't strike twice. Now listen to me very carefully, I tell you. There is no such thing as things. There never have been things, and there never will be things. That's why this place we're sitting in is called the nothing. The no thing. Get it? That sheet that's speeding open a few feet away from us has only three properties, space, time, and energy, and those are whacked out enough all on their own. Let's get logical. Everyone knows that one plus one equals two. Garbage in, garbage out. Add space, time, and speed, and what do you get? You get space, time, and speed, period. Then, far less than a second into the existence of your blasted space-time speed manifold, there comes a rain, a hailstorm, a blizzard. Of what? Of things. Gazillions of them. Roughly 10 to the 87th power, 10 with 87 zeros after it, to be a bit more precise. 
What are they? They're elementary particles, quarks and leptons, all popping simultaneously from a mere whoosh. And it makes no sense. In fact, 